Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Friday, August 3rd, Market Watchers Live show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swenlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Well, we had the non-farm payrolls report out this morning, a little disappointing, uh, but still the, the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average currently up a little more than 50 points at 25,377. The S&P 500 up a couple points. The NASDAQ, which was up earlier, has reversed and is now down 18. The Russell 2000, also up earlier, uh, has reversed and is underperforming on a relative basis, down 11 points today. The 10-year Treasury yield backing off of that 3% level. We got up to that 3, 301 area, testing the highs that we saw back in June, and we are backing back off of it. I think we're in a trading range between the rising 20-day moving average, so watch down around that 2917 uh, or 2.91 percent level, and the 3.01 percent resistance level. I think we're going to continue to trade in this range. Uh, we were unable to get the breakout on the yield with the non-farm payrolls, so uh, I think we do are set up for uh, some more likely consolidation. Volatility index huge drop today it was down uh, toward the low 11s, which we hadn't seen in quite some time, but we are reversing off of that. That could. Uh, be a problem for the market in the near term as we do have a potential bottom in the VIX. The uh, XLP, which is consumer staples ETF, leading the market to the upside, along with utilities, two defensive groups. To the downside, energy continuing to struggle. This is about the fourth day in a row now since we challenged that 77, 78 resistance level that we have been pulling back in energy. Within the uh, industry groups, airlines having a pretty strong day, and they've been acting much more bullish of late. Uh, July was a good month. We broke out uh, above the downtrend line, and notice the pullbacks are holding the rising 20-day moving average, which has crossed above the 50-day. So we're starting to see better technical strength here in the airlines. Pharmaceuticals have been extremely strong, really going back the last two to three months. We'll talk about those uh, pharmas in a bit. And uh, finally, to the downside, Symantec. Uh, saw a big gap down a few months ago, and we are seeing another one today. Trying to put in a bottom with a hollow candle, but Symantec down more than 11% this morning. Not helpful to the technology space. Aaron, it is our last show before we head out to Seattle for ChartCon next week. I'm getting excited. How about you? I can't even wait. Uh, I'm a little stressed, of course, you know, uh, getting everything packed and ready to go. But you know what? My my um, presentation is ready to go. I can't wait to show everybody. Um, Grayson had some nice things to say about it when I handed it over. So, yes, Ooh. I can't wait. I'm very, very excited. It's it's just so fun to see you and, and everybody else in person. Yeah, and it's been a couple of years. I mean, for those of you not familiar with ChartCon, we do this every couple of years. And, um, uh, you know, the last few years, I mean, we've been in this bull market now for about nine years, but of course, this year, we've seen a lot of the volatility picking back up. So there's going to be a lot of folks there talking about, you know, how they're taking defensive positions and preparing for what could be uh, a tougher market down the road. I mean, who knows? But certainly it's made us all sit back and rethink our strategy because 2017 was just straight up. We didn't really have any pullbacks. 2018 has been a different story. Right. Preparedness. That's yep. that's the word. Uh, that's what I'm going to be talking a lot about. So, yeah, it's it'll be strange though. Tom, we'll be actually sitting in the same room when we do the show on Monday. Yeah, that's going to be exciting. Uh, it's, I always enjoy the trip out west. It's coming back that's the problem because then I'm losing hours, but I actually gain hours. So uh, I don't know the excitement and everything building. It's going to be a great week next week for sure. Absolutely. All right, well, let's go ahead and get into our schedule and all of the other exciting things going on. We have an earnings spotlight that'll be on Monday. And then Tuesday, as I was saying, we'll be uh, doing an anatomy of a trade, uh, Tom and I together, looking at each other at the same time. <laughs> August 10th and 11th, as we were just saying, ChartCon, go get your info on it. If you're not signed up, I go do it. Uh, we have a few announcements for Stock Charts TV. And of course, since we will be up there doing ChartCon, we won't have Market Watchers live uh, until the 20th. But never fear, we do have new programming that will be on our TV channel. So you'll want to tune in for that. We have quite a few special segments that we've recorded just for you while we're gone. 
As for today, what are we doing today? First up is Under the Radar, followed by one of our favorites, What Would You Do? And our first 10 in 10 symbol is going to be Service Now. Now. And then we're going to finish up with the sentiment update uh, that I do on Friday. So looks like a jam-packed show. I'm really excited. Hey, we'll be back right back with the technical headlines in just a moment. Okay, welcome back. Uh, let's take a look at the 10-year Treasury yield. We did have a uh, couple of big uh, items, uh, economic items to go over. First, we had uh, July non-farm payrolls out today, 157,000. Market was anticipating 190,000. And if you were expecting maybe a little bit more of a negative reaction, uh, it was somewhat muted, perhaps because June non-farm payrolls was revised quite a bit higher from 213,000 to 248,000. So the 33,000 job shortfall in July was offset by the 35,000 job increase uh, in that June revision. Uh, July private payrolls, 170,000. Market looking for 184,000, so a miss there. But like the non-farm payrolls, June was revised quite a bit higher from 202,000 to 234,000. July unemployment rate, 3.9% matching estimates. July average hourly earnings rose three-tenths of 1% versus three-tenths of 1% expected. So again, we match. Uh, July average hourly earnings, though, for are actually going back into June, they were revised lower. The average hourly earnings last month reported at two-tenths 1%. It was cut in half to one-tenth of 1%. Uh, then uh, at 9.45 uh, a.m. Eastern, July PMI services index came in slightly below expectations, 56.0 versus 56.3. And then finally at 10 a.m. July ISM non-manufacturing index, 55.7 versus 58.8. Uh, and that was quite a miss to the downside there. Uh, all in all, though, you can see after failing, leaving that tail up above the 3% level on the 10-year Treasury yield, we are now starting to push back to the downside. I would watch this 20-day EMA, which is currently around 292, 293. Uh, also, that low was 292 and a half on the last pullback that we saw a little bit, uh, I guess it was earlier last week. So 292 and a half is kind of an area I'd watch the downside to the upside. Again, that 3, 3.01% area uh, would be nice to negotiate because that would indicate money rotating out of the treasury market and that could help fuel a rise in the S&P 500. Unfortunately, when the yield moves in the other direction, it can have the opposite effect. So that'll be something that we certainly wanna keep an eye on. Uh, I mentioned in my blog article, I think gold could bounce and I'm not a big fan of gold, but gold, if you pull up the chart, uh, we did have a close yesterday below these prior lows. And as we've been moving down, you can actually see that the PPO is starting to move back to the upside. So we've had a lot of downside action in gold. It clearly has been an area of the market you really don't want to be a part of. But because we are seeing slowing momentum to the downside, I think we could rally a little bit. Now, this is uh, the dollar gold is the price of gold as of the previous day's close. So it doesn't show today's action. But if we pull up the GLD, you can see that we have moved higher today and uh, up about uh, 79 cents to uh, 115.31 currently. So gold making a little bit of a rally. I think we could extend that in the short term. We shall see. The, one of the reasons why I think we could see some strength in gold is that the dollar yesterday had a really strong day, got up close. You can see the dollar index right back up at 95 on that verge of another key breakout which I think could send the dollar much higher later in 2018. But with all the economic news out today, not so great. If we go and look at an intraday on the UUP, you can see we are, after gapping up a little bit at the open, we have started to reverse and turn back down. So if the dollar again fails at resistance and starts to work its way back down, that could benefit gold in the near term. I still believe the dollar goes higher uh, as we go into uh, the latter part of 2018. And I think that will... Uh, put a uh, kind of a top or a lid on gold. And I think that we will see some of the small cap stocks outperform again. But for now, we have been seeing that the uh, small cap struggle. And a lot of that is because the dollar simply has not been able to make that breakout. Okay, I want to pull up, uh, talk, you know, we've talked many times about August, September not being great months. I want to show you uh, on, on the seasonality tool a couple of things here. First, let's pull up the S&P 500. 
And let's take a look at August and September. You'll see over the last 20 years, August has averaged going down three tenths of 1% and September's averaged going down 1.2%. Uh, if you take these two and add them together, minus 1.5, that is uh, the two weakest consecutive months of any that you see here on the chart. January, February have not been very good either. 1.1% drop on average those two months combined. But August, September, clearly the two worst months of the year. And that not only goes back the last 20 years, but I have uh, data that says that that is true going back the last um, 70 years or so, back to 1950. So what does this mean? If the S&P 500 does struggle, a lot of folks are saying, you know, we can't break out. We've kind of double topped. We might weaken here in August and September. What could that mean? Well, the first thing you have to understand that it probably will mean is that the VIX, which had a nice reversal earlier today, I was saying maybe we might be bottoming on the VIX. Keep in mind that over the last 20 years, look at the average returns on the VIX in August and September. The VIX tends to move higher on average 7.3% during the month of August and 8.9% in the month of September. When you look back and you look at all the other months, for the most part, they're down, uh, but even the months where they're higher, they're not higher nearly to the extent that we see in August and September. So if the fear is building in August and September and the S&P doesn't do very well, what uh, might perform well? Well, let's take a look at gold. Gold, uh, a lot of folks like to hedge with gold. And when you take a look, the two best months are two of the best months, clearly August and September for gold. So got the positive divergence on gold, the dollar's bumping its head up against resistance. You got the VIX possibly reversing uh, and pivoting higher. All of that could lead to a rally in gold in the near term. So that is uh, certainly something to keep in mind. And if you're interested in hedging, uh, and I'm not usually a big uh, hedge person. I think when you diversify and hedge in a bull market, you're just uh, giving away money. But I do think it makes sense sometimes. And August and September certainly have proven to be trying months for the S&P. And given all the things I just talked about, it seems like gold uh, could be in a position where we might see a rally here in the near term. All right, defensive groups have been leading. Uh, let's go back, first of all, and take a look at the sector summary. And you'll see consumer staples and you'll see utilities here at the top. And if we go to one week, we got healthcare, consumer staples, utilities. That's over the last week. If we go to a month, healthcare and consumer staples, two of the top three. We go back three months, we got healthcare, consumer staples leading. So we're seeing defensive groups lead and especially the XLP. And I've had questions recently you know, what is going on with the XLY, XLP ratio that I like to watch? I'm going to go back here. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of this bull market. So let's take a look at the weekly. We will go 10 years and let's do a uh, line chart. And when you look at this, you can see that the XLP has been outperforming the XLY because the ratio XLY to XLP has been dropping meaning that the consumer discretionary has been underperforming. But you've got to take this into context. I mean, look at the huge move we saw uh, into the end of 2017 and through the first half of 2018. Money has been rotating big time into consumer discretionary. You're going to have relative pullbacks, just like you have regular pullbacks on stocks, on charts. Uh, 2013 was one of the best years on record for the S&P 500. It was a really strong year. And the XLY XLP was going higher. But look what happened over the next year. We didn't lose the bull market. 2014 was a bit more challenging, but we saw a little bit of relative rotation back into consumer staples. I think that's what we're going to see going forward here. I wouldn't be surprised to see this ratio continue to weaken. I don't view this as a sign of a bear market or horrible things to come. I look at it simply as relative profit taking after a huge move up in consumer discretionary. So wanted to point that out. Uh, the pharmas mentioned at the opening, they've been performing extremely well since beginning of July. Last five weeks, they've been on a tear, but really this dates back to early May. The last three months have been very strong. As I mentioned, healthcare and consumer staples doing very well. And within the consumer staples area, food products, look at the day we're having here trying to make a big breakout. One of the, re well, a couple of reasons, Metafast and Nutrisystems and MED and NTRS both breaking out on solid volume. But 
uh, a bigger name, Kraft Heinz, uh, came out with their earnings. And uh, Aaron, you, I think you've got some information on that along with upgrades and downgrades. Take it away. I do with that. Yeah, let's look at uh, just what the the earnings did come into. You know, we had revenues of six point six nine billion versus six point five seven billion, so that was great. And earnings per share, dollar versus ninety two cents. And you know, management is saying they're looking for improved profit profitability and more momentum. You know, going into twenty nineteen. But I want to go look at that chart because that's where we really can get the information that we want. So I'm going to go right over here to the one I have all ready to go. All right. So yes, we can see it, it makes sense. You were saying that that's one of the reasons we're getting that big push to the upside. When you look at what's going on right now, you know, KHC, Kraft Heinz is up over seven and a half percent right now on those good earnings numbers. But one of the things I noticed right off the bat was that it hit overhead resistance at about $65, you know, where we were stopped back in June and July. And then also at that low between, you know, February and March, and it got stuck. I do have that PMO buy signal. So I, I would, uh, well, not the signal, but I do see it turning up. But of course, it turned up on a, on a big move like we're seeing today. Uh, you know, I think it would be a possibility here. But I, you know, honestly, I get a little bit concerned when I don't see that, that move uh, above overhead resistance. But you know what? Uh, am I really going to get upset with them that they're not up, you know, seven and three quarters percent today? <laughs> they hit that area of overhead resistance. Totally makes sense. But I would be watching for a pullback. You could see that 20, 50 day EMA uh, just uh, had the crossover, that positive crossover buy signal. So I think this one's set up very well. I would just want to see a bit of a pullback back here because, you know, as we talk about often, chasing. And the fact that it's already gotten stopped there at that overhead resistance, even though it is on a one day giant move, you know, I still would want to wait for something to come back. All right. We had two downgrades today. And the first one is Motorola. And this was downgraded from a neutral to underweight by JP Morgan. And you can see that was uh, certainly bad news for the stock. We are seeing this drop. At this point, it was a small gap here, but it's still a gap down that honestly, when you look at this formation in the thumbnail and even over here on the daily chart, that's a reverse flag to me. That's, you know, you've got the, the deep drop of a flagpole and then some consolidation, and now we have a gap down and we're moving lower. I mean, if anything, I could see this as a shorting opportunity, even though we're down over two and a half percent, simply because we do not see support until, uh, you know, down here at what, 112, 111. But I'm really more, look. I'm looking more at that PMO cell signal. That's the concern at this point. Uh, real quick too, Sun Run, uh, they were also downgraded by Morgan Stanley from overweight to equal weight. So not a horrible downgrade, but uh, you know, I was looking at this rising bottoms trend, uh, trend line and you know, once it broke down below that and as well, the support here at that June top, you know, we haven't been able to, to get back up uh, above that rising bottoms trend line. And that is a bit concerning. And we do have the downgrade. The PMO is pretty darn ugly. So I, I wouldn't be looking at Sunrun uh, anytime soon. Now, we did have an upgrade on Pasira Pharmaceuticals. Uh, they were upgraded by Needham and company from a hold to a buy with a price target of 54. So nice setup here. I, I don't know if we're going to be looking at a move to 54 anytime soon. But you know, we're still seeing a nice move here. There's your flag. And then we got the execution. And now we've set up another flagpole in case we start moving into that consolidation. You know, I'm getting already it's going to be a higher top than the previous one for the, the PMO. And that's a nice uh, bullish confirmation. So thought that looked good as well. And that really is all I had for upgrades and downgrades. I think we should go ahead and slide on into our under the radar segment. Take it away. I shall do that. Okay, so I went and I did a, I took one of my scans and I, I manipulated it uh, a few times to get really what I wanted to see, but I'll let you know what I actually did here. I wanted a US stock 
Uh, I really wish I had increased the volume number there, but I didn't. I ended up having to erase a few out of them, out of my uh, results. And so I would look at, uh, I basically am looking just for a PMO buy signal right now. And I set it up that because I'm going under the radar, I wanted the 50 day EMA to be less than the 200 day EMA. So I wanted to find stocks that have been sort of out of favor for a while, but then I want the 20 day EMA to be above the 50 day EMA. Cause now it means it's starting to pull out and that to me is under the radar. We're getting a, a PMO buy signal and we're seeing some movement to the upside enough that it started to get that, you know, the 20 over the 50. So I did that and I, I narrowed it down to these six. And so I am going to start off with AMC. All right. So here we go. We just had a PMO buy signal today and I did set that. I want to make uh, it clear too, I did set it up for the last intraday update. Um, a lot of times I will set it for the last market close, but I, it was really not bringing me the kind of results I wanted. I wanted to see those that were just now picking up those buy signals. So let me go back here so you can see where we're going here. Now you've got rising bottoms on the PMO from back in June up here to the end of July, and that matches up with the bottoms on price. So I like that setup. The only thing, and I'm gonna get in here and annotate for you. I think that would be helpful. And I'm gonna make it somewhat translucent here. So these are the, the highs that we're looking at right now for AMC to get up and through. And, you know, for me, it's been under the radar in the fact that, you know, you've been mostly in this trading range and we're starting to see those rising bottoms. Uh, I, I like that we are at the top of the range. Normally I wouldn't like that, but the reason I like it is because we did just get that buy signal and we're seeing the scooter starting to improve here. Now it is a, a 4 over 4% move today. So it's definitely become a blip on the radar at this point. But you know, the, the key is, is watching for that pullback, maybe back down here just a bit and then that gives you that opening to move higher and i would look for a breakout just really simply based on on the scooter and you know i think that looks really really good so i will go ahead and save that one the next one i'm going to pull up is charter communications and i thought this one was really interesting and the reason I say that, and again, let me get in here to annotate so that you can see exactly what I'm talking about. All right, so here is a gap that we saw earlier. Let's make that a little skinnier. Don't need the arrowhead either. Skinny that up. Boy, if it were only that easy to get skinny. All right, so what I wanted to point out here is that gap that we saw earlier. And we're now, we went down and you can see it in the thumbnail. We just closed the gap yesterday. We got the momentum push back to the upside, it landed us a PMO buy signal. And I, and we're, we've closed, like I said, we closed the gap and then we moved back up above what could have been considered resistance at the top of that previous gap. So now what I want to do is just look at some potential here. Cause I think this is a nice setup, right? And I'm going to make this again translucent i like to see i don't know if you've ever watched i was noticing uh, i was watching a, a little bit of arthur's show and he likes to use support and resistance zones and i i do too and this is one of the ways i'll do it without using you know a shape uh making it translucent and really all you have to do is set up some translucent colors and and then they're an opportunity to select when you're on your auto support resistance. And there you go. So you can see right now we've got that breakout. We're also seeing, and I'm going to actually drag this one down a little. There we go. We're seeing, we're seeing a breakout already from above these lows. So I, I, I see this as some good uh, possibilities. And again, it's to me, it's been under the radar. It's been in a longer term decline and it's just now starting to pop out. Uh, there's that 2050 day EMA positive crossover. All right, let's move through these just a little bit quicker. All right, 
So here we go, that PMO buy signal's coming in and we're getting a breakout from the declining tops trend line here. And there you go. All right there. So we've had a pop through it yesterday. We're trying to stay above it. We haven't quite done that, but I can see just by looking at that PMO buy signal, it's a nice clean buy signal. And you can see when we've had the buy signals here in the past, uh, you know, since things got volatile, they've been clean and fairly accurate. So I, I like that signal. It also is occurring just above the zero line. And that tells you that there is some internal strength going on there. So I thought this one was interesting as far as an under the radar. Campbell Soup. And, you know, the staples sector has been you know, showing some strength as of, I was looking at it in the last month, uh, we're seeing some strength there. Look at this really nice pop above this area of consolidation. And I think it's set up nicely. You've got some, as far as support and resistance goes, I would be looking back here. And right now we're looking, to, we're testing that. They're testing that overhead resistance. I'm feeling pretty good about it, though, with that PMO buy signal. And the question, I think, when I look at this would be whether we're looking at, um, you know, the PMO being very overbought. And so whenever I question that, I just go down here and, you know, move it out about five years. And that'll give me a really good feel for where my PMO actually is. And so, yes, it is uh, in the overbought area. But we've seen some extremes back here. Uh, we've already popped above that these previous tops. So I think we're pretty safe there. All righty, quick, quick, quick. All right, there we go. Another PMO buy signal. Again, that's what I set up. Uh, you have the breakout that just happened uh, out of this trading zone here. And it's testing it as support. And where is the next level of overhead resistance going to come to play? Uh, not until we get way up here at that 2550 area. So I thought that was also a very nice setup. Look at the OBV, nice pop on that as well with that uh, big volume coming in. And T-Mobile, um, I actually saw the CEO on uh, Fox Business and uh, really exciting. Uh, uh, clearly, he excited a bunch of people the day uh, after that particular interview, I suppose. But we got the big pop. Uh, it did get above that overhead resistance from that previous July top, and it's pulled back now. And so, again, you get that pop, and then you can, we always say, look for that pullback. We got it, but look at that PMO. It is still moving straight up, and it's on a buy signal. So I thought all of those looked pretty good, um, and, I, and I picked them as under the radar because, like I said, they, they've all had the, you know, the 50 days below the 200-day EMA. And generally, at least when I scan, I'm generally looking for, for stocks that have a better configuration than that. Um, but now we're starting to see, like I said, some of these pop with that PMO buy signal. So that's all I had, Tom. What what say you? All right, let's take a look. Uh, first, I'm going to stick with the materials group. I wrote about this in my blog this morning. I think that in the short term, they could be poised for a rally. And similar to what I talked about uh, with gold earlier. I think if the dollar is, you know, struggling to get through resistance, maybe in the short term, we'll see some money rotate back in the materials because this group has been very weak. This is a relative chart of the materials versus the S&P 500 going, going back the last 10 years. So I think for the most part, materials is always under the radar because they just, the, the group doesn't do very well relative to the S&P 500 normally. Um, uh, you know, the uh, I'm going to stretch this back actually a little bit further. Let's go back uh, to the turn of the century. And you will probably, yeah, you'll see the group doing much better relative to the S&P back in the last bull market and even into the early stages of the uh, last bear market. And the reason for that was that the dollar was downtrending. But since 2011, the dollar has been uptrending. And so as a result, we're not in the same environment. Materials are finding it much more difficult to move to the upside, but there are pockets of strength. So I thought first, I just wanted to mention that, you know, this is a group that hasn't been performing well. You can see in 2018 is really underperforming the S&P 500, but I think that there is opportunity here in the near term. If I pull up the XLB on the daily chart, and this is what I put in my blog this morning, 
Here you can see off the April low, we have been uptrending. I think overall the market's been pretty strong. XLB hasn't been great on a relative basis, but it is holding its trend line. And I like that uh, hammer candle yesterday. Uh, Dow DuPont, which is the largest uh, component of the XLB, uh, reported earnings yesterday. They were not good. The stock gap down, it's 22% of the XLB. So the XLB went along for the ride, but both the both Dow DuPont and the XLB reversed and we printed this hammer. So I think in the short term, and we're already seeing a little bit of that strength today, but in the short term, I think we can rally. I think we potentially could make a run up here for about 61 and then we'll see what happens from there. Also, you could use this and draw the trend line going up here and then also draw a trend line coming down and you can see that we're squeezing in a triangle. So you can make a technical argument that a breakout above 60 would be very bullish for the XLB as well. But within the XLB, and actually before I even go there, let's, let's uh, stretch it out to a weekly chart and you can see this triangle maybe a little bit clearer. 2016 to 2018, even though the XLB has been underperforming the S&P, remember the S&P's had a huge run. And so a bull market is characterized by strength in many places and materials were strong. They just weren't as strong as the benchmark in many of the other sectors. So on a relative basis, they lagged but on an absolute basis, they still went higher. So we had this uptrend going into January. I think we've been consolidating here. We've seen the NASDAQ breakout. We've seen the Russell 2000 breakout. We've seen the S&P and the Dow strengthen. The XLB clearly is underperforming, and that's why the 2018 relative strength line was going down when I showed you that earlier. But this pattern is not bearish. It is To me, it's a very bullish pattern. And I think that uh, materials are going to follow the bull market to the upside, but they just probably won't do as well as some of the other groups, especially if the dollar breaks out the way I anticipate. But in the near term, it does, uh, as I mentioned, create some opportunities perhaps. So let's take a look at two groups within the material space. First, I want to pull up the, uh, well, let's take a look at the specialty uh, or specialty chemicals index. And you can see this is a group that's actually breaking out above these earlier highs in 2018. So even though materials are not doing well, the specialty chemicals group is doing extremely well. And we are seeing a breakout. PPO looks good. And if we stretch this out to a weekly chart, you'll see that we had an uptrend. We consolidated. You might even be able to um, argue at inverse head and shoulder, left shoulder, neckline, head, right side of the neckline, uh, your right shoulder, inverse right shoulder. And now we're breaking out. And that would measure, let's just say 965 down to about 880, 85 points. That takes us to about 1050, something like that. Uh, so I think the specialty chemicals index, index um, is under the radar because unfortunately it's part of a group, a sector that is not doing very well. But the specialty chemicals group themselves, are, I think, is doing very well. And we've got some individual stocks I'll talk about in just a second. But the other group I wanted to mention is the paper index. DJ USPP, here's the weekly chart. Nice gap up back in January, consolidation. And you can see that right now, it's trying to break out to its highest level in the last few months. And let's pull up a daily chart, get a little closer look there. And you can see very strong day today. Uh, we'll see what kind of volume comes in by the end of the day. But it uh, looks like we're trying to make this breakout. We do have an intra intraday high back in June we have to negotiate. But right now, this would be the highest close we've seen since back earlier in the year. So I think the uh, paper group looks good. So what individual stocks might we consider? Well, some of these we've talked about recently. CF Industries just reported great earnings, gapped up yesterday with very heavy volume, breaking out. It is pulling back today. I would watch this 46, 47 area on CF. I think even though it's in the material space, I think this is a stock that looks really good technically, and I would not be surprised to see another push to the upside. RPM International, RPM, look at the gap up back in June. It has continued pushing higher again, despite an overall weak um, uh, time of the, uh, of the summer here, last couple months for the material group. Uh, RPM, though, continuing to move higher. Mosaic, trying to make a breakout today. Um, you can see we got up to about $30, put in a little cup here, struggled at $30, and now potentially breaking out. And look at the volume the past couple of weeks, uh, pretty strong to the upside as uh, we move higher. So I think Mosaic looks good. CDXS, another uh, specialty uh, commodity play. 
and, or excuse me, specialty chemical play. But you can see that the recent lows down here at about 1340, 1350, I think look um, somewhat interesting. This was the top over here, uh, just above $13, maybe 13 and a quarter. And these intraday lows are simply going down and testing price support. So as we weaken today, almost 50, uh, or excuse me, 5%, 70 cents, I think as we get closer down to that 1350 level, CDXS looks uh, very interesting on the daily chart, but I actually even like it better on the weekly chart because this is a stock that had been doing very well. And as it pulls back, it's testing the 20 week moving average where you can see over the past 13, 14 months, we have had excellent support and buyers showing up on that 20 week moving average. So CDXS looks good as well. NTR, uh, NTR making a breakout, big volume, pull back anywhere in that 54 and a half, 55 and a half area would look interesting as well. Um, MEOH, this is Methanex Corp. Sideways consolidating here for the last couple months. This one clearly under the radar, but uh, breakout eventually is what I would look for. And that would be a close over 73 with increasing volume. In the meantime, these trips back down to 68, 69 look very enticing. Uh, I also mentioned recently Sherwin-Williams, SHW. They came out with earnings, posted great numbers. Beautiful move up. Three white soldiers, if you're a candlestick fan. Heavy volume. I think there's accumulation taking place. Pulling back, maybe even putting in a little cup here, but I look for SHW to go higher. Cabot, I will uh, say I did sell this one earlier today. I, I owned it, but it went up, hit this resistance area around 67, and uh, I got out of it at that point. If I pull up a weekly chart, you'll see there's a little bit more resistance up around 68. But overall, you got an uptrending stock, sideways consolidation. Eventually, a breakout above 68 is what you want to see here. The last one that I have in the specialty chemicals area is Echolab. Uh, they had a downtrend in play. Look at the volume coming in the past two days as it breaks that downtrend. I think it's making a run for 150 and ultimately a breakout above that level. Three stocks in the paper group. Let me go over those real quickly. VRS. This is a smaller company, beautiful move up. I see a cup, we're pulling back right now, potentially a handle, watch that 20 day moving average. FBR, many of these stocks you probably have not heard of. FBR after moving lower back in March, look at all the sideways consolidation. Earlier when I pulled this one up, we were uh, up closer to that 20 level trying to break out. I don't like it if we fail the breakout, but if we have a strong afternoon and we get back up close to that $20, it could be a, an indication that we are going to fill this gap back up to $21.50. And then the last one I have is Domtar UFS, much larger company. Uh, several tops here around $49, trying to make a breakout today. like to see a little bit more volume coming in, but I think UFS looks good as well. Okay, let's quickly summarize uh, the under the radar stocks that Aaron and I came up with for today. A number of different ways of uh, looking at the stocks and uh, industry groups. But um, yeah, I think uh, materials could be short term looking somewhat bullish. And there are a number of stocks maybe to take advantage with. And Aaron had a number of stocks there as well. Okay, Aaron, it is time now to do the what would you do? We haven't done this segment in quite some time. And uh, we ran a poll. And so let's go ahead and bring our poll up to see what everyone would do with advanced micro devices. The chart, I mean, they came out with great numbers. They blew the numbers away. Top line, bottom line, I believe raised guidance, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, we got 115 responses here. 63% of them are saying wait for weakness to jump in. 16% um, not interested at all in AMD. 10% are saying just get in. 6% saying to short it. And also 6% saying there are other semiconductors out there that are more attractive. What do you think? Do you have a chance to look at AMD? What do you think of the chart? I did indeed. And honestly, I think I could answer it in two ways. So let's go ahead and take a peek. All right, so I was gonna look at the chart on a daily chart and then I'm gonna look at the, I think I had the 10 minute bar chart that I was gonna peek at as well. All right, so I was looking at this and yes, we had that big blowout earnings that we've got it, uh, we'd already have this move, the breakout above that $17 range. And, you know, we've obviously started up some new overhead resistance. But what I was looking at was 
two things. One is what could be considered a flag uh, with a big, nice big flag pole of about three, uh, height of $3, uh, which means that if we got that breakout, we would expect a move of $3 or more. I love that we do have this big decline today because again, some of these we always are talking about and watching for, it's like, oh, got the big breakout or it's moving really fast to the upside. Let's wait for a, a, a pullback here or you know, just uh, getting off of those, those highs. You could also look at this flag. I think somebody was saying um, a symmetrical triangle. I see a declining wedge and you know, in both cases it would be bullish, uh, but the declining wedge I, I really like because it gives us my, I, I get that measurement. And, and though it's only about uh, just under a $2 uh, move when you measure for the, the wedge, it still gets you pretty close to that $23, $22 range. So I know that some of my fans might point over to the PMO and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, it's flattening out. It looks like it's topped. Well, it hasn't quite topped. Uh, but if it does top here, that could be a concern because then we might be looking at a negative divergence going on here. I, I don't see it right now uh, because we don't have that top just yet. And, you know, even if we do get that top, I'm not going to be that concerned, especially in the short term. Uh, so my my answer here is, you know, I think my official answer was that I was going to wait for it to have a little bit more weakness uh, to pull back. But you know, really, as I'm I'm sitting here and I've I've been looking at it, I like that descending wedge. I I think we could get that breakout. I would I would be able to be in that buy it now camp. I generally would wait, um, but you know, for the sake of the exercise and really looking at where support is back here from June, uh, I, I don't know. I'm thinking that looks pretty good. And again, I, I did look quickly at a 10 minute bar chart. There we go. So it's really been in sort of a trading range when you look at the last couple of days and it's at the bottom really of that range right now. So again, I, I think that there's uh, certainly some possibility here. Look back here, we had that double top on the 10 minute bar and it totally executed, filled in the gap, which was also something that we would have been looking for. And it was a minimum downside target and it pretty much hit that. And again, like I said, that seems to be a pretty good area of support and we're right there on it. So what would you do? So I'm gonna go in officially as, um, like I said, eh, let's. I'm I'm going to go in officially as buy it now. I think this one looks pretty darn good. All right, I'm going to go in as buy on weakness. Although I would have no problems um, at least taking an initial position at the current price and then buying more if it were to pull back a little bit further. Mm -hmm. uh, I pulled up my relative chart here, and as far as I'm concerned, since the last three months on this gap up here with big volume back at the end of April, that was uh, AMD's. Uh, quarterly report earnings report back then it was a big surprise changed the character of the chart on this downtrend uh, so I consider that a breakaway gap uh, back to the upside and you can see that the strength has continued since then so I think the action supports the fact that this was a breakaway gap and when I look at the semiconductor group back at this point in time we were sitting at around 3300 we've had a little bit of movement to the upside what's that maybe about six percent where the uh, uh, semis are up. But since the earnings report, I mean, we were trading about nine and a half. We are up almost 100% on AMD, while the overall group has been up about 6%. And what that's translated into is uh, AMD just wildly outperforming the semiconductors to the upside. And if the semiconductors, which still remain in an uptrend, continue to strengthen, I can't see how AMD doesn't get its more than its fair share of money. Um, to the upside. I love the fact that the volume has been so strong. And I know earlier you were mentioning the uh, PMO negative divergence. I'm not sure. I haven't looked at the MACD or the PPO to see if it's the same, but I ignore negative divergences when I see this kind of volume coming in because I can't make, a, I can't make an argument that a stock has slowing momentum when you are getting this kind of volume supporting a move to the upside. To me, this looks like massive accumulation. And that's the one you know, I did a, a thing on a MACD or PPO trading secrets. And one of, the thing to, one of the things to me that's really important and why I look at volume so much is that 
the MACD, the PPO, PMO, all of, many of those momentum uh, oscillators only take into account price action, not volume. So if you make a, a conclusion sometimes based on those looking only at price action and you ignore something that I think is really important in this stock, which is massive accumulation. And so I am a fan of AMD. I, I really like the stock. I think that a pullback, I would be a buyer on the 20 day moving average. So that's why I would be in the buy on weakness camp. But I'd have problems arguing with somebody who's starting to build a position. The stock was $20 a week ago or earlier this week and is now down 18 and change. You've already gotten a decent pullback. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it goes down to the 20 day. I don't know if it gets back to this gap support level or not. So I would not be, I wouldn't argue with anybody who is uh, jumping in at the current price. Yep. And, uh, Right. The, the OBV popped beautifully on all of that volume and accumulation on that big move up. So I, I agree with you as far as the negative divergence goes. And like I said, I don't quite have it yet, but the, you know, the chart pattern, the, you know, just the, the price action, it just all is, it, it doesn't speak to a negative divergence as far as momentum, clearly. Mm -hmm. Yep. I would agree. Yeah. So there we have it. So I think, you know, there was a lot of different uh, opinions, I suppose, um, different ways to look at it. Of 6% said they'd short it. I, I could not short AMD, not in this market. No. Um, no, I'm definitely not in that camp. Yeah, I mean, it could pull back maybe to the 20 day. I mean, if it's a short term short, you're just looking for, you know, just a, a pullback to, you know, the 20 day moving average, which we've seen a couple of times in the past few months, then, uh, you know, I guess I could, I could see that. But I like to short weak stocks. I don't like to short stocks that are outperforming the market. I totally agree. All right. So well, we did. I, I just want to make mention that we did open up the uh, a new poll, the sentiment poll. So I'd love to get your opinion on what you think the market will do next week. Will the S and P five hundred close higher or lower? or mostly unchanged, you know, with a difference of about a quarter of a percent. So if you could go in and vote, that would be excellent. And while we've been doing all of this, I've also been multitasking and putting together our 10 and 10. Uh, right now, I do need you guys to go in and vote because I have a couple ties going on in the most popular. Uh, right now, we're wow, there's like a three way tie, four way tie. So get in there and, and do your likes because the second uh, the one that's most popular will be the second 10 in 10 stock. So our first one is going to be now. I have, uh, I guess we can go ahead and share the, uh, let me go ahead and grab this so I can show you what we got going here. All right. So I've got about 27, uh, which is interesting. Usually we get quite a bit more, but you know, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to show these to you in the RRG form mainly because I, I want to come in here and look at our sectors and see what everybody has been looking for. And there you go. Honestly, um, Tom, uh, materials clearly under the radar. We only have one, one request for that um, with Oceana Gold, which I will more than likely be putting in there. So let's go ahead and get started, though. We're almost like starting right on time. So let's get started now with now <laughs> we are starting with now uh here you've got a nice trend line moving higher so i'm i'm a fan here uh some would look at this and say well what about all this volume on the selling well we haven't really broken down so volume to me is important in combination with price uh, we saw a lot of selling back here uh, as you can see but that didn't stop the the move to the upside we held on to the prior low and we continued moving higher we saw massive volume in early February after a big move up. A lot of times you get the huge move up, you get a little bit of profit taking. I don't know if maybe this was after an earnings report, what, but uh, it's not, just because we're going down on volume doesn't always mean that you're going to continue to go down or that it's bearish. I know that uh, Bruce Fraser has talked about it with Wyckoff a lot of times when you're getting a lot of volume to the downside, but it's holding on to support, that it's actually a, an accumulation phase, a reaccumulation phase. And so that's the way I kind of look at it as well. I think as long as the price action remains bullish, I don't pay as much attention about to the volume. Now, if we break down below prior lows, for instance, that June low, if that gets lost and we see this kind of volume, I think that's a change in character on the chart. But otherwise, I think now looks good. Uh, if you look at the software group continuing to perform well, now versus software continues to perform well, though we are at a 
we've been a little weak the last few weeks, but we're near relative support. Uh, now versus the S&P, same thing, a little weak recently, but holding on to relative support. Clearly, we have been advancing, though, software versus the S&P has been very strong over the past year. So this everything's set up on this relative chart, really the way you want to see it. Price action moving higher, and then all the relative strength is there. I'm a fan. I still like uh, now for for now. For now. <laughs> now. I know. It's just it, it really rolls off the tongue there. Okay. Uh, looks like we do have a tie for our most popular, so I will do both of them, but we'll start with... TJX companies and apparel retailer, TJX. All right. A lot of sideways consolidation here. Actually, I'm going to pull this one up on that relative chart as well. I think it was leading. Yeah, definitely got a nice breakout versus the apparel retailers group. And now as it's continued moving higher, you can see that the retail group has been kind of moving a little bit lower. So I think this one still looks pretty good. The, the relative strength has continued to pick up here. So overall, I don't really have any problems. I would like to make sure I hold on to the recent lows, though. So as far as annotating, I think I would look at these recent lows right in here at about 94. We want to make sure we hold that. Currently trading at 96 and change, almost 97. I would look for another breakout, but to the downside, I want to see 94 hold. The problem is if it loses that level, then you're below the 50-day moving average, obviously below the 20-day. You lose price support that held for about six weeks. And we went straight up. So the problem is if you lose that support level, you may see a mirror image on the other side moving back down toward the mid 80s. So I want to keep a, a pretty tight stop here, but I like TJX. Okay. And the other one that was tied for most popular was uh, Teva, T-E-V-A. Okay, Teva. Well, it uh, now this one, I think losing that price support level could be a little problematic especially with that heavy volume. So that's what I was referring to. I don't really like it when you get the big volume and a character change like that, where we had the, the uptrend in play. Also check out the relative strength. We've got pharmas, which are now uh, really had a huge, huge July. And uh, Tiva was not participating in that move to the upside. In fact, actually moving lower. And that's what created this negative um, kind of a negative divergence kind of a situation, at least on a relative basis. Um, but now we've got the big volume down move to confirm it. So there's a couple problems here, and the big one being price support being lost. And I could look at price support a couple of different ways, but here you can see clearly top in January, another top here in May. We break out on increasing volume in June, come down, and instead of holding uh, price support, we've broken below it. We're below the moving averages. I think this one is one that I would probably pass on for now until it strengthens and shows me that it's uh, it's it can uh, um, I don't know heal itself here technically. I would uh, I'd go elsewhere in the group. I think there are a number of pharma names that look good, including Le uh, Eli Lilly, uh, Pfizer, which I know uh, Mary Ellen McGonigal talked about quite a bit the other day, and even Merck. Uh, so those are some other names I'd consider. All right. Let's see the next one. Like I said, uh, the only materials one that was requested, Oceana Gold, O-C-A-N-F. All right, first thing I noticed, light volume. Um, stock's a $3 stock, and it's traded 4,800 shares today. So if you got uh, about thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000 on you, you can basically make the entire market in Oceana Gold today. This is a stock that I just wouldn't trade simply based on that. Now, if I'm just looking at the price chart and I'm not paying any attention to the volume, I think the double top breakout is important. Um, you got the top there, maybe even go a second one right up here uh, to where we closed. So I'm going to say this 295, 296, 297 area was difficult. We did go through. And when we went through, you can see the volume picked up to the downside. Now you've got price support and that rising 20 day. Uh, right near that 295 area. That's where I would look for support. But again, you know, with this kind of volume, um, I just, I, I can't trade a stock like this because it's just subject to too much manipulation. All right. I think this next one looks interesting. Teladoc, T-D-O-C. Also, a lot of people wanted to see that one. Yeah, Tel Teladoc, I think, looks great. Now, there will be some who will look at this and say, well, what about this topping head and shoulder pattern? Um, I'm not a fan of this particular strategy um, because I don't like upsloping necklines. 
um, because you can break this support and you've still got major support over here. So I've seen I've seen many stocks look like this and look like they're breaking out of a head and shoulder pattern and then hold on to the key price support and turn back to the upside. So volume's been heavy. I'm sure that's got a lot of folks negative. I'm bullish. I think the stock goes higher. I think that the overall trend here continues to be very strong. You know, we had a stock that ran from 55 to 70. Anybody getting in at 70, you see the stock move back down the low 60s in just a couple of days, you're going to panic. So you're going to create a lot of this volume to the downside, which is exactly what market makers want. Uh, so they can accumulate for the next rise to the upside. I think stock goes back over 70 and challenges the high from a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I like that pullback to, you know, that top from back in June, too. I think it's it's really set up quite nicely. All right. How about uh, CATM Cardtronics? And the person actually said they bought it yesterday and then sold it this morning. And now they're like, OK, what do I do now? <laughs> Well, first, congratulations, because you got a huge move uh, today. The stock closed at 24 yesterday, opened to 28 and a half. I don't know where you sold, but I tell you what, when I see a stock like this and it breaks out above, clearly breaks out above overhead resistance, when it comes back down intraday, and I don't know exactly where I would have set a stop if I owned it, but probably maybe 31. I might have given it a little bit of room underneath this, but I would not allow it to come all the way back down here like this. So hopefully you're able to capture most of the profits here. Um, I think the stock's just you know sideways. I don't know if this was earnings. I'm assuming it probably was, and they reported great results. But if you can't make the breakout and you've been trading sideways for a while after the, the earnings, until we get that move to the upside and get that breakout, I would expect more of the same sideways consolidation. So I'm going to pass on it. Okay. This next one actually came up in one of my scans for that under the radar, uh, but I opted out of it. Uh, GoPro. G Pro. Yeah, GoPro, they make those cameras. Um, and the stock has been under uh, some pressure for quite a while. I think if we pulled up a longer term weekly chart, you would see what I'm talking about here is the selling. Um, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and annotate this weekly chart because things are looking up. Uh, I definitely would admit that. But the last breakdown came on the lows that we saw and the huge gap down that we saw on massive volume earlier this year. Um, what is this, over 80 million shares traded on the GoPro here in uh, early uh, January. This is a weekly chart. It's about 80, um, well, 90 million over a week. So what's that averaging uh, 18 million, 19 million a day? And today, 37 million. So we certainly have, uh, or well, this week, I should say, 37 million. So we've got the volume picking up. But I think we got overhead resistance. I'd, I'd like to see it through this gap resistance before I would uh, be be cheering this one on or thinking that I got some some gold uh, with GoPro. So I'm skeptical. I like the volume. I like the, the reaction because I think this was earnings as well. So I like the push to the upside, but I'm still a little skeptical with that long term downtrend. All right. Uh, I think this one actually looks kind of stinky. And I, I imagine I imagine you're going to think the same. Looks big reverse flag. Uh, it's CBS. And I, I even pulled it up on your relative chart just for the heck of it before I, before I handed it over. Yeah. And, uh, not good. Yeah, I would agree. I think there are some stocks in this space that look really good. CBS is not one of them. Uh, we did have a negative divergence in play prior to the selling here, which I will show you. But here is your higher price right here. And I... I I tend not to ignore these, especially if the uh, if you fail to hold the breakout. So here we breaking out above what 58, 58 and a half. We come back down. We couldn't hold it, and then we try to get back up over 58 and a half. Can't do it, and then the selling kicks in. I'm assuming this is probably earnings related as well, but and I, I wouldn't held into earnings anyway. But that negative divergence is telling me that we're probably going to get a 50 day test, which we did. We actually went right through it. And I agree with you, Aaron. You know, you got a PPO in negative territory, massive volume on the selling. I think we got a character change, probably going to head back down to test this uh, support in the 47 and a half to 48 and a half area. All right. The next one up is Intellisat Global. Uh, we have symbol is just I. And I, I pulled it up on a weekly chart and I, I don't really like it. Uh, it's rolling over. 
Yeah, I mean, the stock has gone from in April three and change to 21. Right. Um, I mean, clearly, I mean, look at the volume. There's a lot of buying. There's a lot of interest in the stock. I'm I'm not going to say that I'm negative on the stock. I think it looks pretty good. It did just recently break out. I'm going to shorten this chart, though, because it's gone up so much that it's hard to even pick the uh, the, the areas of support. OK, so over the last two months, uh, you can see that there was clear overhead resistance here. This is another perfect example of what I talk about, where you break above intraday, taking out that prior high, but you can't do it on the close. We actually did it two days in a row. Where do we go? Back down, we put a hammer, <clears throat> excuse me, a hammer on the 20-day moving average. That would be the buy. This up here is the sell from a short-term perspective. Once again, we did the same thing. Two trades, two di different days above resistance, failed, went back down to the 20-day again. Now we make the breakout. So now I would be viewing $21 as pretty good support. And if we do fail to hold that, I would look to the rising 20-day moving average. So my... My aggressive entry would be here at $21. My more conservative entry would be half of it at $21 and half of it if it gets down to the 20-day moving average. But I actually like I. I think that there's a lot of accumulation going on, and I follow the price action and the momentum, and this one clearly has it to the upside. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, the, it looks like it. Uh, its IPO was right up there in that 16, let's see, $16 range. And yeah, to fall all the way down. And like I said, I'm looking at this weekly chart and it was back in 2016, uh, below a dollar. It was like a penny stock for a little while. So this, uh, I don't know, for me, I, it's just, um, I'm not liking it. I just, it doesn't, it doesn't excite me. All right. The last one is going to be Hospitality Property Trust. And I think this one does also looks pretty interesting. Uh, HPT. Yeah, I think it's in a long term kind of flag kind of a deal here. So it's been a little boring for the last couple of months, but clearly you have an uptrend right there. And anytime you get consolidation, I like the basing. I like stocks when they go through basing periods. So let's pull up the tops, which no doubt, and look at this reversal today, by the way. Once again, looks like we're breaking out. We reverse. Those are short term sell signs in my view. Uh, 27 and a half to about 2860 or so is the trading range that I think the stock is just stuck in right now. Um, it is a REIT, so these sometimes don't move nearly as fast as uh, other stocks. So if you're a short-term trader like me, I'm not, I normally don't trade a whole lot of REITs. Uh, but I, I think that this is still in a pretty good pattern. But the reversal today has me concerned. I think we'll go back down to 27 and a half, and I like entry there better. All right. And that concludes the 10 and 10. We did really well today, I would have to say. There are your symbols. I will get those up into the Market Watchers Live chart list after the program. And you can find them there, relative charts and everything with those annotations. Copy them to your own chart list. Really helpful. All right. Well, you know what? We'll be right back with the final market update after this message. So hang in there. Volatility is back and interest rates are rising. With the markets headed into uncharted waters, ChartCon 2018 is here just in time. See how the experts are protecting themselves and watch live from the comfort of your home or office as they reveal the risk management strategies they use to stay profitable in any market. Plus, you'll get complete video recordings to watch on demand for years to come. Join us at ChartCon 2018, streaming live August 10th and 11th. All right, it's time for our final market update here on Market Watchers Live. Looks like most of the markets are consolidating a little bit, although we're seeing some nice action here off of the Dow and a nice rising trend to continue what it was doing yesterday when it, it came off its intraday lows. S&P 500 is higher, uh, but mostly consolidating sideways. Uh, NASDAQ is falling a little bit here. It's in the negative, but it is consolidating sideways at this point. We'll have to see if it can get itself up and over into positive territory. S&P 100, mostly consolidating uh, in positive territory. Mid caps, looking somewhat similar to the NASDAQ. We're seeing uh, lower prices right now, but looks like it might be making a move to get back up into positive territory. Small caps, though, Russell 2000, 
it's opened higher and started moving down ever since. We really don't, it doesn't look like we've hit, uh, you know, a bottom on intraday lows just yet. TSX mostly unchanged. Treasury yields fell, but they are starting to rise just slightly, currently reading 2.96%. UUP consolidating just below yesterday's close. Gold having a great day, at least GLD, big gap up. It has pulled up off of those intraday highs and is getting ready to test that gap support. USO oil lower on the day, but also trying to make a comeback. It's pulled back uh, about half of those losses from this morning. And the VIX continuing lower, currently reading at 1162 and that concludes the final market update. Tom, I'm going to pass it to you. If uh, you had something interesting, you might want to show us. Yeah, I'm going to go in and take a look at the Russell 2000 relative to the S&P, because I speak a lot about the fact I like small caps um, as we go into the second half of the year. The top part of this chart, you can see that this is the relative strength of the small caps versus the S&P 500. And we have no doubt been uh, moving lower here over about the last six, seven weeks. Um, after a pretty steady March higher from uh, March through or late February all the way through the middle part of June. Um, if you notice, though, the relative strength, um, as the dollar rises, we tend to see the strength in the Russell 2000 on a relative basis. And as the market or as the uh, dollar weakens, you can see the relative strength goes down. Then we come rallying back up in the dollar and up we go with the Russell 2000. And currently, the dollar is just simply sideways consolidating. And the Russell 2000, by the way, is doing the same thing. I, even though the relative strength is weakening, you can see that the Russell 2000 actually, at this point, could be establishing an ascending triangle off of this uptrend where you have equal highs coming across. And uh, just recently, when we started to pull back and we failed at 1707, I wondered out loud if maybe the bottom of this move was going to be higher than the prior where we could see perhaps an ascending triangle. And so far, that has been holding. We'll see whether or not that continues. But I think as long as we hold on to this low around 1630, 1640, I think eventually we're going to get the breakout in the Russell 2000 to coincide with the breakout in the dollar. And I think that's when you're going to see this relative strength pick back up again to the upside. So just wanted to clarify because I do get a number of questions, number of emails uh, regarding some of these relative ratios that I use, like the Russell 2000 versus the S&P, and also like the XLY versus the XLP, which I talked about earlier today. So that's all I had. So I'm going to let you take it away, Aaron, and uh, move back into the sentiment. Give everybody that sentiment update. All right, I shall do that. And just as a reminder, if you could go in and take our poll and let us know what you think the market's going to do next week. I kind of take that into account. I send that to the Wall Street Sentiment Survey, and I'll give you the results and see what's going on with that. So let me get to, to our sentiment charts. All right. Let's go ahead and start with the put call ratio. Uh, the 10 day moving average of the put call ratio. Again, now we're gonna be, we're moving into sentiment and remember that sentiment is contrarian, meaning if everybody is very bearish, that typically means you're gonna get a reversal to the upside. And if investors are particularly bullish, you're likely gonna see a reversal to the downside. And I like to look at uh, sentiment from a, a shorter term perspective you know, into a longer term perspective. And so that's what we're going to do as we go through these charts. So the first one, as I said, we're going to look at the put call ratio. And what I wanted to note is that we have bottomed and we are heading higher, meaning that we're starting to see a bit more bearishness as we start coming up. So we really do want to see high readings on the put call ratio for the CBOE and the equities. Because once you get to those highs and then you tip down and top, that typically means you're going to see a rise in the market. But right now I'm paying attention to these bottoms. And like I said, it's I think it's good news that we have bottom because typically once you bottom, uh, that's when you're going to see that top and you are going to start moving lower, but we're starting to work our way back up. And so I think that will be positive. But at this point, I'm going to list these 
uh, put call ratios in the neutral category because we are simply rising. We've already formed a bottom. And, you know, typically, like I said, when you're rising, you are going to see the market turning down. Uh, but we're not really seeing that right now. I'm seeing more of uh, a, a likelihood of, of a consolidation, if anything. Uh, so right now, that's what I'm reading on the put call ratios. The next one is the Association of um, American, uh, the American Association of Individual Investors. This is a poll that uh, people can take on the aaii.org website. It is simply a poll, sim like what we're doing here in Market Watchers Live. You just tell them, I'm a bull, I'm a bear, or I am neutral. So what we're seeing right now, as far as the AAII, are less bulls. You know, we're starting to see a little bit more bearish sentiment going on. And you can even see that the bears have started to increase slightly. What I really want to make a note of right now is, is this uh, bull bear ratio. We want it to hit very lows, uh, low readings, because that means that people are very, very bearish. And again, when people are very bearish, that's when you need to start looking for those reversals. I think we're about in that territory right now with that bull bear ratio. Uh, I'd like to see it get a little bit lower, more to that uh, three quarters uh, line, but I will uh, take the fact that it is under one, meaning we are leaning to the bearish side. Uh, and again, I've marked where we have these uh, lows and typically it comes before a price rise. So, I mean, we can drag these around and I could show you a uh, similar action. I didn't mark every single one of them, uh, but they're fairly accurate. They're fairly accurate. So the fact that we are seeing them getting lower and below one with the, you know, leaning toward uh, bearish sentiment as far as the, the voting goes, I think that's really good news. I, I like to see that. Uh, so I would say with the, the AAII, uh, I like this. I think we're looking bullish as far as the market goes because we are seeing that expansion in bearish, uh, in bearish sentiment of the investors and a, a, a clear decrease in the bulls. So the next one I'm going to look at is the National Association of Active Investment investment managers name, they report to us uh, the exposure of these uh, money managers. How exposed are they to the market? And, you know, we've seen some extraordinarily high readings and high readings typically mean, of course, a lot of bullishness. So I usually will look for a week or two later, uh, a rise, you know, you'll sometimes get it right off of that. But um, uh, I'm sorry, a decline. <laughs> Wait, okay. If they're very, very exposed, that means they're very bullish. So then I would start looking for that decline. It doesn't necessarily happen right away. Sometimes you're going to see a little bit more upside because these guys are, you know, they, they are the experts. They handle a lot of other people's money, as they say. So seeing where their exposure is, you know, they tend to be on the right side of the market at first. At least that's what I, I gather from looking at at this chart. So what we're looking for at this point is we want to see exposure getting pulled back, pulled back, and that shows that they are starting to get more bearish. And again, the more bearish, the more bullish it is for the market. So we are seeing that pulling back, but we're certainly not near any of these, um, you know, extreme lows. Uh, I think it's, if you look at it right now, I mean, it's lower for, for what we've seen previously here with these very high readings. But in general, I'm looking at this as mostly neutral, uh, but they are pulling back that exposure. And I think that's going to be eventually uh, positive for the market. But for now, I would be a little bit, uh, I, I would feel a little bit more neutral just because these guys do tend to be on the right side of the trades a lot of the time. All right, uh, let's go into my Rydex analysis chart. All right, and on this, uh, this is a, a chart I need to explain before I go into it. Uh, bear with me, those who watch this update often. But uh, Guggenheim has a group of funds that used to be owned by Rydex, and the funds were set up that you have the bear funds, that you have 
uh, the bull funds and sector funds, and then you have uh, money market, of course, funds. And so what, what Ridex does, Guggenheim now, is they report to us every evening the current amount of assets in each of those classes. And so what we do is tabulate where the assets are going, and then you can get some of that, um, you know, cash flow uh, I identification and that can tell you how investors and participants in the market are feeling is uh, feeling about the market without it being a finger in the wind sort of poll. Uh, this is this is money where your mouth is is like uh, is what Carl and I like to say. So I find these to be especially helpful when I am identifying what's going on with sentiment and what I noticed, and you can especially see it, of course, in the thumbnail, is that we are seeing a rise in the assets in the bear funds, and we're seeing a rise of assets in the money market funds, yet we're getting a slight decrease in the bull funds. So what does that tell us? That tells us that investors are feeling bearish. They're, they're going into the bear funds, so they're getting into that shorting environment, or they're pulling out and they're just uh, you know, laying into cash a bit more, sitting in more of a neutral position. Uh, I, I see that we didn't lose that much in the way of assets from the bull funds, uh, almost unchanged. But the fact that we started seeing this bearish activity going on with money markets and the bear funds, I think that expresses to you what uh, investors are feeling, and at this point, they are feeling more bearish, and we've seen that on these other sentiment charts, and less bullish. I'm not going to say that they're completely bearish, because we only lost a little bit in the way of assets toward the bull funds. All right, so that is the main ones that we look at, and I'm going to see what I have here for Wall Street Weekly. And last week, um, we ended up with only 11 percent bulls and over 56 percent bears uh, when we did this survey. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on this survey. Um, my father actually had a message board on AOL. That's how Decision Point started. And one of the things that they did was, uh, you know, take a sentiment poll. Well, when he decided to give up uh, that particular portion of his, uh, his AOL board, uh, Mark Young uh, picked it up. And he expanded it into uh, quite a creation. It's not just the poll. He, he has an amazing newsletter and things like that. Um, but it's, it basically is pooling. And it's really been, as he says, almost a static pool of pollies uh, that haven't really moved. So when you're looking back in time, and the, these you can go back you know, in, into a, a yearly form and see how much uh, these have gone through. But the main thing uh, to understand is that it's been mostly static. So it's a pretty, uh, you know, looking at what their their opinions are over time, uh, you know, it's 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 pretty good. Uh, these guys usually hit it pretty right. They're pretty much on the money a lot of the time. Uh, but uh, like with the money managers, you know, still when you start seeing extreme bearishness and extreme bullishness, you need to think about that. And right now, you can see this is extreme bearishness that went into the week. So, um, you know, polies, myself included, uh, and I did go in lower. I'm pretty sure I, I called in lower for this week. It uh, doesn't look like I'm going to be on the, the right side of that call. But because we all came in very bearish, uh, that that set us up for the, the reversal. So I'm seeing the, this bearish activity. I'm going to be really curious to see in a few minutes here what you guys are thinking with the poll. So go in there. If you haven't taken it, quickly get in and get your vote. And we'll see where the audience stands. All right. But now I'm going to go take us to... I want to take us to my VIX. And somebody was joking, I think it was last Friday, uh, where I talk about the VIX and breath. And they said, is there any cure for VIX and breath? I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, so now I, I'm going to start calling it breath and the VIX. <laughs> All right. So what I noticed right here uh, going into this chart is the fact that right now, 
and we were commenting on, on it earlier, Tom, that the VIX readings are getting very, very low right now. And consequently, we're seeing a push out of the upper Bollinger Band. Now, I do invert my VIX because when you get those very uh, bullish readings in terms of people being very complacent and very much not worried about the market, typically in the very short term, that's when you're going to get a reversal. But I only consider it a, a, a one, two day reversal. I, I mean, I think it's a really good one for, um, I, I think it's a really good one to tell uh, what the, the short term sentiment is. So I'm looking at the very short term reversals. So I only want to pay attention to these for the next day or two. And then I also watch what's going on with the um, net advanced declines for volume and issues. And based on what I'm seeing here, we did get this puncture of that upper Bollinger Band. And that that is typically a uh, is bearish for the market over the next day or two. But I want to caveat it because you can see as we've gone through here, the Bollinger Bands have really tightened up. So it really doesn't take much to get a penetration on the upside or the downside. For example, we got a penetration yesterday to the downside, and that would have put us in the, we're gonna see an upside move today. Well, so far so good, we're getting that. But now we're getting that puncture on the ups, upper uh, Bollinger Band. It's just, we're gonna see these off and on until we start seeing a bit more volatility. And then I will consider it uh, very helpful. Right now, I'm not thinking it's that helpful, but when I look at the, the we have some really, really good upside um, breadth at this point, uh, but not climactic uh, to the upside and not climactic to the downside. So I'm really not seeing any initiations uh, or exhaustions on the buy or sell side. I'm just paying attention right now to that VIX, but again, have to give it a little less uh, uh, weight. So, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and let's, uh, Let's summarize what's going on here. Uh, so when I look at all of these, and I'm going to uh, put you to the right side of these bullets, we've got a neutral, we've got a somewhat bullish, a somewhat bullish, a bullish, and then a bearish for a day or two. So I, I put that all together. And to me, you know, we're seeing investors leaning bearish, and that's somewhat bullish for the market. I'm not going to say we're set up with enough sentiment to the downside to say, yes, yes, it's bullish. Uh, but I think the VIX with all that complacency to me tells me that, you know, the first part of next week might see a pullback. All right. So that uh, concludes it. Tom, I know uh, I do want to look at that poll uh, before we move on. Okay. So everybody right now is still feeling pretty bearish about next week. Uh, I don't know about you, but really when I look at those uh, sentiment charts, um, some of the earnings that are coming in. I think I'm gonna go into next week higher at this point. What do you, what say you? I am gonna agree with the masses, I'm going lower. Wow, we're totally on the opposite side. And what's crazy, Tom, and people, I don't know if you've watched the show, how regularly you watch it, but let's face it, Tom, you're almost always saying higher. Yeah, I'm, I'm generally pretty bullish, but I do uh, respect the August, September downdraft that we tend to see, I think the, uh, s p it's been up a little bit this week and it's challenging you know recent highs so we could be looking at a potential double top and i don't like the way the money has rotated into individual uh the various sectors i pointed out earlier in the show that we've been seeing defensive stocks leading and while that's fine for the near term and it's fine for consolidation it's generally not a good thing um for the market you know while it's happening so i pulled i just wanted to pull up this chart before we wrap up the show Mm -hmm. and, uh, on the top here, you can see the S&P 500 and how we've been going higher. This is a, an hourly chart going back the last three months. And so this is when we've seen defensive stocks outperforming. But here's the, the uh, S&P breaking out uh, to new highs back at the end of July. And now we're moving up to challenge those highs. But look at where technology is on a relative basis. Look at what's been going on with consumer discretionary. Look at what's been going on. We had the industrials bouncing, and now all of a sudden, past few days, we're losing traction there. Financials, same thing. And then you look at the defensive groups. You've got consumer staples breaking to a new high. 
Utilities, uh, eh, just kind of more sideways action here for the last month. But then healthcare breaking out the new high. So I just don't like exactly what's going on in the market. I think uh, normally when you see defensive groups outperform, the market tends to struggle a little bit. So I'm going to go lower. Um, and then once we get past the first week of a month, we do tend to see profit taking anyway. That's just the history of the market. So that's some of the reasons why I want to go lower here. All right. I, I could see your point. And I, I know when I was doing some of the sector analysis just before I was setting up those under the radars, uh, I, I was seeing a lot, in, you know, as far as the, the sectors setting up, a lot of those defensive sectors uh, on the top. And it kind of makes sense. You know, we've had kind of an interesting, um, you know, moving sideways a lot here, consolidation. It doesn't surprise me to see that. What we do want to watch, like you were saying, though, is seeing some of those stronger ones doing better. Yeah, I mean, we saw uh, so much uh, leadership from technology and consumer discretionary for a while. There's nothing wrong with them pulling back and letting the other areas move higher for a bit. But it's just hard for the market to move higher when that's happening. Yes. Well, we'll see how it works out next week. Uh, next week, we are going to be in Seattle, you and I. Uh, we will have market watchers Monday and Tuesday, but after that, we won't be returning until the 20th. Uh, but no worries, that week that we're gone on hiatus, there will be special segments that a lot of our, our group has uh, recorded for you. All right. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Please remember to complete the survey as you exit. We do love to get your feedback. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Friday afternoon, everybody. Be safe this weekend. We'll see you back here on Monday and make sure you get registered for ChartCon. Happy trading. Volatility is back and interest rates are rising. With the markets headed into uncharted waters, ChartCon 2018 is here just in time. See how the experts are protecting themselves and watch live from the comfort of your home or office as they reveal the risk management strategies they use to stay profitable in any market. Plus, you'll get complete video recordings to watch on demand for years to come. Join us at ChartCon 2018, streaming live August 10th and 11th.